Okay, so I've got three products here. Um, the the top is some of the as uh, part of my collection of the uh, the uh, Gary Lafontaine um, Quick Fingers Quick Fingers Sparkle Yarn in yellow that I've gotten from the book mailer. I have a whole bunch of this stuff. Um, the second one is the Karen Dazzle Air. Uh, this is the earlier vintage stuff in banana, uh, which is 2617, that's the color number. And then the bottom one is the uh, also the, the Karen Dazzle Air. It's the later version, um, and it is also in 2617 banana. And then I have all three strands there, and um, I believe... I'm not sure because some of my sparkle yarn from Quickfinger or from uh, the book mailer is within the last say 10 years so I, I believe the, just looking at this stuff I believe that um, that what they were what they were selling is the Karen Dazzle Air stuff it, it's the most commonly available uh, stuff that you can find at, on eBay um, I don't know if you can see this or not, but there's a there's a comparison of the of the uh, of the fibers there. I've combed them out. I've taken a ply and combed them out. Um, it's very they're, they're the same color. The banana uh, is the same as the yellow from the book mailer. Now, one thing that is difficult to see in these uh, is that the uh, they are reflective. Um, so the the Antron or the Creslin, um, two different products, but Creslin's an acceptable substitute, um, had a percentage of clear fibers in them. And you it's hard to see in this video, but I can see them with the naked eye. Um, the frosty look that people talk about with the original um, sparkle yarn is present in these, and that is from the clear fibers. About 25 to 33 percent of these were clear fibers of the ply. So that's um, that's kind of what we're looking at. Okay, now this is the same same stuff I've had out, but I've added this. This is um, this is the dark gray sparkle yarn, the dark gray quick fingers uh, quick fingers sparkle yarn from the book mailer. And the reason I I put this in here, it's um, it looks a little different um, in terms of the thickness of it, but the what I wanted you to see here is if you can see that is um, because of the gray, the, the, the clear fibers are kind of actually um, a little bit easier to see. You'll hear, you'll hear people referring to the correct Antron or the correct Creslin as being frosty. And that was, again, due to the percentage of the uh, clear fibers in the, uh, in, the plot, in, the strand, in each strand. And this kind of this shows it a little bit. The, 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 uh, the three that I have in the banana are the same way it's just it's just a little bit more difficult to see because of their light color okay so here's another um, shot again uh, at the top you have the uh, quick fingers um, uh, Antron sparkle yarn from the book mailer the uh, second one in the middle there is the uh, older vintage Karen Dazzle Air yarn and then the um, the third one is the uh, later vintage Karen Dazzle Air yarn. Both both of those are in banana. And then what I've added, what that one there is, that's what you get when you buy Antron Sparkle yarn from a fly shop. Okay, um, and that's a different color. That's golden yellow. Um, so it's Antron. It's tri-lobal, and you can't really see it here. Um, 
it, it traps air, it does all the things that Antron does, but it doesn't have the proper reflectivity because it is missing some of the, it is missing the 25 to 33 percent of the clear fibers. You can still use it, um, but what a lot of guys do um, today is they'll mix, you know, they'll mix it with a quarter of uh, say white or clear Antron if you can find it. Okay, so that's kind of the comparison when you're talking about sparkle yarns and the correct sparkle yarn. Well, that's that's what we're talking about. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do here <clears throat> is I'm going to tie I'm going to tie Gary LaFontaine's Deep Sparkle Pupa. Um, I'm going to tie it with a bead. Um, this is going to be a long video, probably a 20 minute video for a two and a half minute fly. But um, uh, there's I'm going to talk about the yarn and what is what is the correct sparkle yarn, where you can get it, um, and if you can't get it, what you can do. And then I'm gonna um, well, I'm gonna talk about colors a little bit, just briefly. And then um, uh, I also want to show you um, some of not. I want to show you how not to overcomplicate this thing. There's a there's actually quite a few videos out there on tying either the emergent sparkle pupa or the deep sparkle pupa. Um, the two patterns are basically the same except for what you do after you put the overbody on, um, whether you add a wing or, or, or whether you add the, um, uh, the, the side legs and then tie it off. Um, a lot of guys, a lot of people, they struggle with the overbody. And there's all sorts of videos out there um, where they, they do things like um, uh, they, they'll tie it in place and comb it down a certain way and then um, basically spend a lot of time trying to get the overbody to spread correctly. Um, if you watch any of Gary's old videos, he didn't, <laughs> he didn't do it that way. And he was a slow tire. He did, he did it pretty quick. Now, don't get me wrong, I have struggled with, I've struggled with um, tying these patterns too. Um, but uh, he did it, he kept it pretty simple, that's kind of the way I like it, and I can, I'll show you what the hang-ups are. The big issue is, is getting the, the big problems that people have is getting the, um, getting the overbody, or some people call it the sheath, getting that to where it doesn't have gaps in it. And um, if you tie it exactly the way that Gary did in his videos, you, it's much less likely to get those gaps and, um, uh, and, and you'll have a proper fly, all right? Instead of struggling with it and trying, trying to get it to where um, um, combing it down and combing it to the sides and doing this and that. I'm not saying those methods won't work, I'm just, you know, um, they, they take a long time, all right? So let's talk about sparkle yarn or Antron yarn, okay? so. So this is what, if you go to a fly shop, this is what you get, all right? And um, um, it'll work, uh, but it's not quite right. It's Antron, but it's, it's just not quite right, all right? So the original sparkle yarn was Antron, trilobal, but it had a certain portion, a certain portion of it were clear fibers, all right? And... Um, it was it was originally marketed under several products, uh, so, uh, at least four or five different products. All right, the um, the one that is the easiest to find, um, to my knowledge, in yarns, it's no longer made. I might be wrong on that, um, but the easiest one to find is this. This is the Karen the Karen Dazzle Air yarn and, and Gary if you watch his videos or, or, or read read his books um, he talked about he talked about four different um, trade names there was Dazzle Air Dazzle Air was made by the Karen Karen Yarn Company alright um, and there's, there's two different versions of this stuff alright this is the older version um, and then this is the newer version. The both the same color. This is banana color number 2617. The one of the differences, the main difference between the two versions is this one is 60% acrylic, 40% nylon, 
and this one is 80% acrylic, 20% uh, nylon. Does that make a difference? Probably, from what I can see, without looking at it under a, micro, a microscope, it doesn't make a difference. Um, and I'll tell you, uh, kind of a, a barometer that, a kind of a barometer that backs that up is the other product that he recommended was, it was, by the trade name, was called Sparkle Air. Okay, Sparkle Air, um, was part of the Wintuck line and it was made by Woolworth Woolco. Okay, you can still find it on eBay, on eBay, but it's not it's not as common as the Karen Dazzle Air. All right, now this the Karen Dazzle Air, I believe, I'm pretty sure is Creslin. Okay, Creslin is a type of Orlon. It is trilobal. It's just like Antron and in caddis flies. Gary says that it is a perfectly acceptable substitute. I also note some of the Sparkle Air products, or at least the Sparkle Air yarn that I've seen, it's 50% acrylic, 50% nylon, the version that I've seen, and I believe it is also Creslin. Um, don't know if there were earlier versions that, before that that were um, that were not uh, that were Antron or not. There's also you'll also hear another product called Puff and another one called Twinkle. Um, that he talked about. I think the puff yarn, um, I think it was made by Red Heart, Red Heart, and um, if you see, I've seen some pictures of this stuff, and on the label it says it was a Wintuck product, which tells me that it was actually made for Red Heart by Wool Woolworth Woolco, all right? So this is, like I said, this is banana, and, and the reason I chose this color is because um, the color I'm going to tie and the, the, the version that I use a lot is the brown and yellow uh, deep sparkle pupa. Um, the other stuff I have, you'll see a big bag here, this is my collection of um, sparkle yarn from the book mailer. Okay, Gary Lef it was Gary LaFontaine's signature products and um, so I have a bunch of their sparkle yarn, their touch dubbing, things like that. Um, I bought the, uh, you know, I have, I have more than enough for the rest of my life in this bag, but I also bought these um, these Dazzle Air off of eBay to uh, just to check and um, trying to get the color narrowed down. There's a lot of confusion over the brown and yellow deep sparkle pupa and the color combination, all right? Um, I'm not, I think I know I think there's some misunderstanding and and uh, under the terms so uh, under the terms Gary used in the book so um, anyway so if you haven't used the deep sparkle pupa or the emergent sparkle pupa they're exceptionally effective patterns um, I use them I'm a still water guy I use them for lakes the brown and yellow the it turns out the brown and yellow uh, deep sparkle pupa actually is very good for a lot of the lake dwelling caddis like Banksiola, uh, Clistornia, um, Agripnia, things like that. Uh, the Phyrogonia uh, family. They're, the larva and the pupa are usually kind of a golden yellow. All right. Um, for streams. I will tell you, uh, I used to live in Wisconsin for a couple of years and I used to fish streams in the Driftless. Um, caddis are exceptionally important there in April and May and um, I can tell you that I used the Deep Sparkle Pupa tied in the beadhead version and um, it was extremely effective. You know, I, I usually use two flies back in those days when I was fishing those streams. Uh, the point fly would generally be a um, uh, coolie scud, Matt Wagner's coolie scud, and then the dropper would be a, a bead head deep sparkle pupa. And uh, that combination provided me 25 and 30 fish days on, on streams like the Big Green, the Blue River, Timber, um, Timber Coulee, and uh, Castle Rock Creek. All right, so if you're, if you're into caddis, um, fishing caddis or streams that have them yeah you th these are great flies all right okay in the vise we've got a size 14 uh nymph hook it's a 1x long 1x 1x strong it's part of uh 
my leftover Daiichi or uh, Daiiki collection. But you can use any any good 1x uh, long, 1x strong nymph hook like a TMC 3761. I've also got a brown bead on this because we are trying tying the brown and yellow um, deep sparkle pupa. Okay, so put your thread on. And you can wrap back. I usually wrap back about uh, three quarters of the way to about that point. Okay, now we've got the sparkle yarn. And uh, this is the Karen Dazzler yarn that I've been talking about. And uh, so, in banana. Um, and so you got to separate it out. For a size 14 we're going to need two plies, one for the top, one for the bottom. The best way to separate this is two plies at a time. Don't try one because you'll, it'll, it'll tangle. And then you've got your, um, you've got each separate ply. Okay, just like that. Alright, so what you're going to do here, do then is take your plies one for the top, one for the bottom, and you're gonna comb, you're gonna comb it out. Got a little mustache comb here. Okay. Tie in the top one. Okay, you don't have to tie it to the sides or do anything weird like um, to get this right. Very simple, just keep it simple. Tie it back. Just like that. Alright. Now, for your second one, your second ply, your bottom ply, same thing, comb it out. All right, there's a lot of, um, what's the correct color for the brown and yellow? So, there's going to be a lot of people that disagree with me, but you'll, you know, his, um, the, the color combination that he, he specifies in the book, brown and yellow, uh, black and yellow, brown and bright green, a lot of people believe that one, one, um, the first color, um, the first color is for the underbody or the overbody and the, and the head and the second color is for the underbody. My experience is, my experience, and there are some exceptions, my experience is if you look through the color combinations, the first color is the head. The head and the wing if there is a wing. The second color is for both the underbody and the overbody. I can be wrong on that now um, and I'll show you an exception here in a minute. Okay, so. So for the second one, what he would do, he would wind up a little forward from the videos I've seen. He would tie it in, all right, and then what he would do is he would let, he would just let the thread torque spin it down, spin it underneath, just like that. That's what he would do. Again, the idea is to keep this simple. All right, so one of the confusing things about this particular color combination is the term golden russet or russet. So, okay, so russet, russet is rust brown, okay? He specified in caddis flies for the overbody, for this particular, he specified um, golden or russet for the overbody, all right? And then for the underbody, he used a mixture of, um, Golden, I think it was golden or yellow, uh, yellow sparkle yarn with brown dubbing. So it was kind of a mixture. All right. So um, what I have here is I have a mixture of a mixture of um, the banana yellow sparkle yarn and some um, rusty brown. Uh, what is it? The uh, Wapsie Superfine Dubbing. 
So the key to getting this right so that it will dub on with the touch dub technique is it has to be cut and chopped fine. So you cut it really, really small, really short, um, very short. I, I, I don't even know I go one eighth of an inch and then I mix it up in a, in an old, in a coffee grinder. That's how I do it. All right, so we'll try to pull the sparkling yarn out of the way so we can dub it. All right, here we go. Now, you need a good tacky dubbing wax. I've tried a lot of them, and um, um, uh, most of them don't do the job right. So this here, if I can get it to push, is this is Overton's Wonder Wax, and if you watch any of his videos, this is the stuff he used. Now, this is my first time trying that, trying this. I've tried a variety of stuff, and like I say, some work better than others, some don't, all right? So, you just grease it up. We'll see how this works with this stuff. And all you do is you take a bunch of your touch dubbing or your yeah your made up touch dubbing and you just touch it. See how that see how that works? That's all you gotta do. The key and it doesn't it needs to be sparse. Like he says, so important to get this dubbing technique right. This is all you do. Okay? And you just wind it on. Again, it, the underbody needs to be sparse. Sparse. Don't. That's all you do. Okay. All right. So now it's time to do the dreaded overbody. All right. So what happens with this thing is there there can be gaps, and I've struggled with it. He didn't really struggle with it much, and when I watched his videos, there's a couple things he did. The first thing that um, that he didn't do that a lot of people make the mistake of doing is they try to tie, they try to spread and tie both of them in at the same time. You don't want to do that. He he would tie it. He would spread the top. He would spread the top over, and he would try to try to separate it out. He would just spread the fibers over the top. And I've got the bottom hooked to this. There you go. Okay. He would make one or one or two wraps, tie it in. And then what he would do is he would spread the the bottom ply and tie it in. Okay. Why does that make a difference? Because the reason why, when you, what happens, the, the reason that you have gaps in this fly, in the overbody on this fly, is what will happen, it's the thread torque. It will twist, it will twist the, uh, usually it's the bottom ply, it will twist it, and that twisting will, will push some of the fibers together, leaving gaps, okay? So he's done that. Now, and I'm unprepared for this next step, is, I need my bodkin. All right, so I got the bodkin, and then all he would do, you, so we've only got a couple of wraps holding this thing down, so all he would do is he would pull and he would spread. He would spread the sheath.
All right, and that's all there is to it. We can make it a little bigger if we like. Another thing that helps is to pull it, pull it different ways. All right. So now we've got it where we want. Now you just tie it off. Tie it off. Put a few wraps in front and trim. And my scissors are getting to the point where they're not very sharp. All right. Put a few wraps in there. All right, now we're coming to the part of the fly where I have issues with. Got a nice sheath on there, nice underbody. We're good to go, all right? So now we've got, we've got to do the legs. All right, so I've, I've had a lot of trouble um, over the years with these, and I still do, with these, with these legs, all right? And so for the brown and yellow, you're using just, uh, you know, wood duck dyed, um, duck fibers and you tie it down okay I can never get this perfect but I don't know that it has to be perfect it just needs to okay tie one in on the side on each side. There you go, just like that. I usually struggle with this really bad. Trim them off. All right, now you're ready to finish the fly. So, um, you could just lay a few thread wraps in. You could do that. Um, with the, because you've got the bead on. The other thing you can do is you can take a little bit of the of the uh, Calabatus, or I'm sorry, the uh, Wapsi uh, brown dubbing, not very much, you just need a little bit. Just a little bit. And just make a couple of wraps. Okay, just like that. All right, maybe I'll put a little, just a touch more because there's a there's a stick of a little piece of yellow. One of the things that I've done here, kind of intentionally, is I'm tying it in a 14 and not, you know, a lot of guys when they tie a fly like this um, for video is they'll tie a they'll tie a larger size because it's easier to show and and I haven't because and the reason I haven't I did that on purpose because just to show you that it. Um, you know, I want it to be realistic for the sizes that we tie. Okay, so now we're ready to finish the fly, all right? And so I do this a little differently than most. Um, I don't do a traditional whip finish on this. This is all I do. Use a little bit of crazy glue. On the thread, just a little bit. Just like that. Then I wrap it right in behind the bead, about four to five wraps, and then all I do is I throw in a couple of half hitches. I do have a whip finisher. I do whip finish flies, but um, there you go. You can, you know, two will work. I, I usually do three or four, but um, 
So that's it. That's the finished brown and yellow deep sparkle pupa. All right. Yeah, the legs might be a touch long, but um, um, wonderful fly. Um, I love, you know, I, this guy, I never had the pleasure of meeting him, but he has probably influenced me more than any, uh, many, any other uh, fly fisher fly tire. Um, he did actually, um, you know, if you look in caddis flies, he talks about a little bit of lead weight for uh, on the uh, underneath for weight. But in fly fishing the mountain lakes, he talks about using a bead, much like I did. And uh, of course, the color of the bead is um, dependent on the version you're tying. So, um, yeah, there you go. So that is the brown and yellow deep sparkle pupa, or at least the way I think it ought to be tied.